It walked right through the closed door, blue eyes framed by white blonde hair, bloated green skin, a cut on the right side of her lips. Her knuckles were oozing thick, rust-colored blood. You're hearing an actor named Scott Leon Smith read from a novel that I wrote about a man who moves to Wyoming and who in this scene is seeing the apparition of a woman who was murdered on a local gun range. About a dozen people sent us auditions to read the audiobook of the story, and we decided on Scott because he sounds and reads like the Iraq War veteran the story follows. Unlike the main character in the story, I don't think Scott is a military veteran, but just like the protagonist, Scott did spend a long summer in a rural community in a house where things were not okay. In this episode of That Doesn't Happen Every Day, in which we interview everyday people about things that don't normally happen every day, we find out what happens when the actor who read your ghost story encounters them in real life. Scott takes us to a rural part of the Appalachian Mountains, where he and other actors performing there for the summer were given free lodging at an old house in the woods. So I'm standing outside this house. I thought, this is going to be an interesting summer in this two-story house. A small balcony with a couple of columns there. The plantation house, and the paint is flaking off. And I'm thinking the house is beautiful, and that it's probably got a lot of room in it. But when you were inside the house, there was a lot of space, but it was very cold, and there were lots of mice. Unfortunately, mice weren't the only problem. Scott describes what he saw when looking out the back window. It doesn't register at first. You think it's a giant dog. It was a medium-sized black bear. It was big enough to scare me because it was right outside the window, sniffing around. Who do you call when you see a black bear on your porch? The Game and Fish, 911. From this interview, I learned if you're an actor, you call... The artistic director at the theater. That's right. The artistic director at the theater. There's a bear in our yard. And she said, just bang some pots together, it'll leave. I went out on the porch, banged some pots together, and it just bolted for the woods. It was terrified of us. I think the fact that Scott called, of all people, an artistic director of theater productions and actually got a useful and helpful answer about what to do about a black bear speaks volumes to the diversity of experiences and know-how people involved with theater might have, especially in rural areas. In addition to bears, the new arrivals also found something else unsettling about the house. There was a kitchen that was not very sanitary. There were mice all over the place, but there was a trap door. You go down the stairs, down at the bottom of those stairs, and looking down that tunnel, it was just this big, yawning maw of of a corridor, almost. And when you looked down that corridor, there was a certain coldness that you felt... There was almost an echo of noises of animals down that tunnel. And there was some wires for light up on the ceiling, all the way into shadow at the end. And nobody would really venture too far into the tunnel because it did not look safe. The record showed that it was a stop on the Underground Railroad for slaves going up north. Like I said, it it just did not look safe. And as far as I am aware, nobody tried to find the end of it. Given that the house wasn't a real comfortable place to be, the theater troupe tried to spend as much time as possible outside, usually having bonfires. When the sun goes down and the stars aren't out, it is almost completely beyond pitch black. When you have a bonfire in the yard, talking to someone across the fire with them, lit by the fire gave them an otherworldly quality. The designer for the season was there at a bonfire one night and he just looked up and said, who lives in the attic? And we said, nobody. And he said, nobody's up there. And we were like, nobody should be up there. Uh, We've got someone who lives just off the attic and he was there in the circle and he said, I did not turn that light on. I don't know why that light is on. We went up. If you got near the door to the attic, you started feeling uh, this bizarre sense of dread. You felt a hollowness in your, your chest 
and uh, we called the attic the shining room, like something awful had happened in that room. You push that door open, there were five or six more stairs, and you get to the top, and it just feels like something's something's pushing on, on your shoulders. It's not cold that you feel, it's constriction. Being in this, this dark little space with a couple of people beside you, you just feel like a lot of you is being cut off by your air when you turn the light on. I'm going to interrupt right here. When someone is telling me a creepy story and they go up into the attic and say the light is about to be turned on, I'm mixed with horror and excitement to see all kinds of spooky stuff from cobwebs to a creepy old rocking chair facing the corner or maybe dolls in Victorian dresses or better yet, a really old wicker wheelchair like they had in the changeling that speaks of someone who might have been kept in the attic against their will. Let's cross our fingers, folks. Here we go. I mean, there was just there was nothing up there. Dang it. Even with that normal look of the attic, it still felt like you needed to get out of there. It felt suff- it felt suffocating. One of the interns that worked at the theater brought her mom, who was very attuned to spiritual energy, and she started crying when she was uh, next to the door to the shining room. She's like, nobody go up there. Please do not go up there. It's awful. The way she said it, you absolutely believed her. She wasn't putting on a show. She was absolutely feeling what she felt and was sometimes afraid for us, you know, living in the house. As with every haunted house story, you have to ask, why didn't you leave? Sometimes you have to stay in weird places. Again, you're an actor and you're just happy to get the work. There was a strange shaped door under the stairs that we never opened because we never knew what was behind it. So one night, uh, it's probably about three o'clock in the morning, I'm in bed uh, in that weird state between uh, wakefulness and sleep. In my head, I see this strange shaped door under the stairs. In my mind, I walk up to the door. The door opens by itself and I see a set of stairs leading downwards into the dark. I thought, am I seeing something that I shouldn't see? And at that moment, I feel like someone is sitting on my chest. There's a weight on my chest and it's pushing me down into the bed and I could see the pillows beside me and I felt almost like I was drowning. I just screamed and and threw my pillows everywhere because it just felt like there was a person in the bed with me trying, trying to murder me. I've been lucky to have never experienced it, but apparently the feeling of having someone sitting on your chest and making it hard to breathe is incredibly common and has been reported by different people all over the world. According to what I could find in Northern Europe, sometimes people called it being ridden by the hag. In Vietnam, it was sometimes called being held down by a shadow. In Mexico, some people described it as having a dead person on you in a phenomenon called subirse al muerto. More and more people are just calling it now sleep paralysis. However, it seems like people don't really understand exactly what causes it or exactly what's happening. And one of my friends who had an experience with it said it still seemed paranormal despite everything she read about it. I asked Scott what he thought his waking dream meant. It also had a reputation, the house did, for being haunted. Uh, Certain awful things had had happened there back in the 1920s. There were old stories about a child being abused in the house, locking the child in closets and things like that. And when our friend's mother was there, she said that that, that's what she felt. And she just felt guilt and shame and fear uh, and pain uh, in the house everywhere. Does somebody know what's down there? And now that I'm thinking about what might be down there, is that why... I've got maybe a ghost sitting on my chest. I would say that the ghost was probably the parent who was doing the abusing, like trying to keep that place a secret. I honestly don't know what happened to Scott, but one coincidence that I thought was interesting about this episode is that in the novel that Scott narrated, the main character cannot get over the fact that he killed a civilian and the apparitions he sees are deeply tied to the guilt and shame he feels. 
When Scott mentions what might have happened in the house, the idea of feelings of shame and regret living on past whoever experienced them scared me more than anything else he talked about. For the rest of the summer, uh, I don't think I got a whole lot of sleep. But we also uh, you know, stayed together, and the main living room was filled with mattresses. Everybody was sleeping together in one place downstairs so that they didn't have to be up in the bedrooms because it was a very creepy place. Uh, sometimes, even if it was too scary to be in the house some nights, across the street at this truck stop, we could get one of the best breakfasts in the state and it was open all night. You'd just go over and drink coffee and, and have some eggs or whatever and hang out. In fact, when I came back the next summer, I, I demanded to go to a, an apartment that was not that house. I wanted to thank Scott for sharing his story on the show today. The audiobook he made of The Burka Cave, about an Iraq war vet who moves to a small town in Wyoming and tries to help a boy haunted with the specters of people who've been murdered in this town, is available at the link in the description. Or if you go on Audible and search for The Burka, B-U-R-Q-A, Cave, by Dean Peterson, you'll find it there. Also, if you would like the book as a paperback or ebook, you can get it at the link in the description or by doing the same search on Amazon.com. If you're listening to the show on the radio but want to hear all of the episodes, please do a search for That Doesn't Happen Every Day, two words, podcast, and you should be able to follow the show online and hear all of the old episodes for free. If you are in need of an actor or a voice actor, I've linked Scott's information in the description as well. Going out, we'll put an excerpt from the audiobook of The Burka Cave if you'd like to check it out, and I hope to have a new show to you soon. Thanks. Chapter 1 They said there was a body out there. Somewhere in the gray clay hills, past the gleaming shell casings of 22s lying in the dust, beyond the farthest landing of a bottle rocket's pink rudder. Her corpse was rumored to be somewhere in the narrow canyons that twisted into a cobwebbed maze of crumbling peaks and eroding ravines. Tim stared down at the sun-baked carcass of an antelope, its skin pulled taut over a gaunt frame, now void of guts or meat, just bleached bones and fur the hair coming off in tufts from its leather, jerky skeleton. At over 7,000 feet above sea level, there was little atmosphere to resist the piercing white light of an August sun reflecting off the clay. It started, like a lot of memories, at the tip of Tim's nose, a tingling electric sensation that swelled over him like a heat wave. A momentary lapse of time and space, a single teardrop of sweat that rolled out of an armpit over his ribs and made him feel like he was there again.